Hi and welcome to my lecture on lower genital tract infections. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Docina Obigaine. Main reference for this lecture is Comprehensive Gynecology, 7th edition, Chapter 23, Genital Tract Infections. And here's the outline of my lecture. So first, we talk about infections of the vulva. There are many causes of vulvar pruritus and irritation, and there may be acute or chronic causes. So under acute, we have contact dermatitis, infections brought about by candidiasis, scabies, HPV, molluscum contagiosum, and trichomoniasis. Under chronic causes, we have contact dermatitis, vulvar dystrophies, infections, neoplasia, and atrophy. So first, we talk about infections of Bartholin glands. Bartholin glands are two rounded pea-sized glands deep in the perineum that are not palpable unless they are enlarged. Bartholin glands are located at the entrance of the vagina at about the 5 and 7 o'clock position in the groove between the hymen and the labia minora. Mucinous secretions from Bartholin glands provide moisture for the epithelium of the vestibule. The most common cause of Bartholin gland enlargement is cystic dilatation of the Bartholin duct, typically caused by distal obstruction secondary to nonspecific inflammation or trauma. Differential diagnoses are mesonephric cysts of the vagina and epithelial inclusion cysts. Mesonephric cysts are generally more anterior and cephalad in the vagina, whereas epithelial inclusion cysts are more superficial. The cysts may vary anywhere from between 1 to 8 cm in diameter and are usually unilateral, tense, and non-painful. Now, this cyst may eventually develop into an abscess of the Bartholin gland and this tends to develop rapidly over 2 to 4 days, presenting with difficulty in ambulation and sitting. Acute pain and tenderness brought about by an abscess of a Bartholin gland can be very severe and the pain is usually secondary to enlargement, hemorrhage, or secondary infection. The signs include erythema, acute tenderness, edema, and occasionally cellulitis. Positive cultures from Bartholin gland abscesses are often polymicrobial and contain a wide range of bacteria similar to the normal flora of the vagina. Asymptomatic cysts in women younger than 40 years old do not need treatment. Simple incision and drainage of a Bartholin gland cyst or abscess is not recommended because recurrence after IND is very frequent. So the surgical treatment of choice for infections of the Bartholin gland, specifically the cyst or abscess of the Bartholin gland, is marsupialization. And this is to develop a fistulous tract from the dilated duct to the vestibule. So how do we do marsupialization? So an elliptical wedge of tissue, uh, such as uh, seen here, is excised over the cyst just proximal to the hymenal ring. Okay, so a cruciate incision is made into the cyst wall and the edges of the duct or abscess are inverted and sutured to the surrounding skin, such as what you see here in this uh, picture, with interrupted absorbable sutures, usually chromic. So, forming an epithelialized pouch that provides ongoing drainage for the gland. And after a few days or probably a week, this will secondarily heal once all the abscesses are drained. An alternative surgical approach is to insert a word catheter, such as uh, this catheter that you see here in this picture. This is a short catheter with an inflatable Foley balloon. And what we do is uh, you can make a stab incision over the cyst wall and then insert this uh, catheter uh, and then leave it in place for four to six weeks. Women older than 40 years old with gland enlargement require a biopsy to exclude adenocarcinoma of the Bartholin gland. Excision of a Bartholin duct and gland is indicated for a persistent deep infection, multiple recurrences of, of abscesses, or a current enlargement of the gland in women older than 40 years. Next, we have pediculosis pubis. 
The skin of the vulva is a frequent site of infestation by animal parasites and the two most common being the crab louse and the itch mite. So, pediculosis pubis is an infestation of the crab louse or the pithyrus pubis. Okay, so the crab louse is also called pubic louse and is a different species from the body or head louse. Lice in the pubic hair are the most contagious of all STIs, with over 90% of sexual partners becoming infected following a single exposure. The louse's life cycle has three stages. So, we have the egg or the nit the nymph, and adult. The entire life cycle is spent on the host. The predominant clinical symptom of Laos infestation is constant pubic pruritus caused by allergic sensitization. Examination of the vulvar area without magnification demonstrates eggs, as you can see here, and adult lice, this one, and pepper grain feces adjacent to the hair shafts. For definitive diagnosis, one can make a microscopic slide by scratching the skin papule with a needle and placing the crust under the under a drop of mineral oil. So next we have scabies. Okay? Scabies is a parasitic infection of the itch mite, Sarcoptes scabiae. So this is transmitted by close contact. However, unlike louse infestation, scabies is an infection that is widespread over the body without a predilection for hairy areas. The adult female itch mite digs a burrow just beneath the skin, and this burrow is a pathognomonic sign of scabies. The predominant clinical symptom of scabies is severe but intermittent itching, and more intense pruritus occurs at night when the skin is warmer and the mites are more active. Scabies has been termed the great dermatologic imitator, and the differential diagnosis includes almost all dermatologic diseases that can cause pruritus. Therapy currently recommended is permethrin, 1% cream rinse, applied to affected areas and washed after 10 minutes. Or pyrethrins with piperonyl butoxide, applied to the affected area and washed off after 10 minutes. An antihistamine will also help alleviate this pruritus. Now, to avoid reinfection by pediculosis pubis or scabies, treatment should be prescribed for sexual contacts within the previous six weeks and other close household contacts. Now, bedding and clothing should be decontaminated. That is, uh, machine washed or machine dried using the heat cycle or dry cleaned or removed from the body contact for at least 72 hours. Next, we have Molluscum contagiosum. This is a chronic localized infection consisting of flesh-colored dome-shaped papules with an umbilicated center. And this umbilicated center uh, in, in the papule or on the papule is the pathognomonic sign for Molluscum contagiosum. So the Molluscum is spread by direct skin-to-skin -skin contact. It is primarily an asymptomatic disease of the vulvar skin and unlike most STIs, it is only mildly contagious. Widespread infection in adults is most closely related to an underlying cellular immunodeficiency such as during HIV infection, chemotherapy, or corticosteroid administration. Now, to confirm the diagnosis of molluscum contagiosum, uh, the white waxy material from inside the nodule may be expressed on a microscopic slide and the uh, intracytoplastic molluscum bodies with right or gem sustain confirms our diagnosis. So the major complication of molluscum contagiosum is bacterial superinfection. Molluscum contagiosum is usually a self-limiting infection and spontaneously resolves after a few months in immunocompetent individuals. Next is genital ulcers. So as you can see here, we have five differential diagnoses for genital ulcers. And so we'll discuss each of these one by one. Okay, so first off, we have genital herpes. This is a recurrent viral infection that is incurable and highly contagious. Herpes is transmitted during episodes of asymptomatic shedding. And there are two distinct types of HSV type 1 or HSV1, and type 2, HSV2. HSV1 is the most commonly acquired genital herpes in women younger than 25 years old, and in some series, HSV1 may cause lower genital tract infection in 13-40% to 40 of patients. 
Genital HSV1 is transmitted from oral labial lesions to the vulva during oral genital contact or from genital to genital contact with a partner with genital HSV1. Paresthesia of the vulva skin followed by the eruption of multiple painful vesicles which progress to shallow painful superficial ulcers as you can see here in this picture over a large area of the vulva are common, uh, commonly seen in patients with genital herpes. The ulcers usually heal spontaneously without scarring, and most symptomatic women have severe vulvar pain, tenderness, and inguinal adenopathy, and simultaneous involvement of the vagina and cervix is common. Systemic symptoms including general malaise and fever are also common, and symptoms of vulvar pain, pruritus, and discharge peak between days 7 and 11 of the primary infection. Recurrent genital herpes is a local disease with less severe symptoms and on average, a woman will have four recurrences during the first infection. The clinical diagnosis of genital herpes is often made by clinical inspection. Herpetic ulcers are painful when touched with a cotton tip applicator, whereas the ulcers of syphilis are painless. The most accurate and sensitive technique for identifying herpes virus is through the PCR or polymerase chain reaction assay. The western blot assay for antibodies to herpes is the most specific method for diagnosing recurrent herpes, as well as unrecognized or subclinical infection. The treatment of HSV1 or HSV2 may be used for three different clinical scenarios. So the primary episode, recurrent episode or daily suppression. Antiviral therapy is recommended for or for all patients with primary episodes. Episodic therapy for recurrences can shorten the duration of the outbreak if started within 24 hours of prodromal symptoms or lesion appearance. Antiviral medication should be started as early as possible during the prodrome and definitely within 24 hours of the appearance of lesions. Now, the CDC recommends that acyclovir or other suppressive drugs be discontinued after 12 months of suppressive therapy to determine the subsequent rate of recurrence for each individual woman. So, as you can see here, uh, we have a table here that summarizes the antiviral treatment for herpes simplex virus in the non-pregnant patient. So, essentially, we have three options. We can give valacyclovir, acyclovir, or famcyclovir. So, there are different doses here for different episodes. For example, for the first clinical episode, we have um, valacyclovir with dosage of 1,000 mg BID 7 to 10 days or acyclovir 200 mg 5 times a day or 400 mg TID for 7 to 10 days and from cyclovir 250 mg TID for 7 to 10 days. So um, different dosages also for the recurrent episodes and the daily suppressive doses. Next, we have granuloma inguinale. This is also called donovanosis, and this is a chronic ulcerative bacterial infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue of the vulva. This can be spread sexually and through close non-sexual contact. However, it is not highly, highly contagious, and uh, chronic exposure is usually necessary to contract this disease. This is caused by an intracellular gram-negative non-motile encapsulated rod, Klebsiella granulomatis. Initial growth is a nodule that gradually progresses into a painless, slow-progressing ulcer surrounded by a highly vascular granulation tissue. So the ulcer has a beefy red appearance, as you can see in this picture, and it bleeds easily when you touch it. The ulcers are actually painless and without regional adenopathy. Typically, multiple nodules are present, resulting in ulcers that grow and coalesce, and if untreated, will eventually destroy the normal vulvar architecture. Diagnosis may also be established by identifying Donovan bodies in smears and specimens taken from the ulcers. Now, Donovan bodies, such as seen in this uh, picture here, appear as clusters of dark staining bacteria, with a bipolar or a safety pin appearance found in the cytoplasm of large mononuclear cells. The CDC recommends azithromycin 1 gram orally once a week for 500 or 500 milligrams daily for 3 weeks and until all lesions have healed. Okay, so alternative antibiotic regimens are as follows. We can give doxycycline 
ciprofloxacin, erythromycin B, or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Next, we have lymphogranuloma venereum. This is a sexually transmitted infection and is caused by the serotypes L1, L2, and L3 of Chlamydia trachomatis. In women, the vulva is the most frequent site of infection, but the urethra, rectum, and cervix may also be involved. There are three distinct phases of vulvar and perirectal LGV. The primary infection is a shallow, painless ulcer that heals rapidly without therapy and this is typically located in the vestibule or labia. A secondary phase consists of a painful adenopathy that develops in the inguinal and perirectal areas. The infected nodes become tender, enlarged, matted together, and adherent to the overlying skin, forming a bubo, or what we call the tender lymph nodes. The groove sign, now this is the groove sign, this picture here, is the double genitocrural fold and is actually the depression between groups of inflamed nodes. And this is a classic pathognomonic sign of LGV. And lastly, the tertiary phase is when the bubo ruptures spontaneously and form multiple draining sinuses and fistula. And these are classic signs of extensive tissue destruction of the external genitalia and anal rectal region, which may occur during the tertiary phase. So the diagnosis is established by detecting chlamydia trachomatis by culture, direct immunofluorescence, or nucleic acid detection from the pus or aspirate from a tender lymph node. In the absence of a specific LGV diagnostic testing, patients should be treated based on the clinical presentation. So the treatment for the treatment, the CDC recommends doxycycline 100 mg twice daily for at least 21 days as the preferred treatment. An alternative therapy of choice is erythromycin base for 500 mg four times daily orally for 21 days. Next, we have chancroid. Chancroid is a sexually transmitted acute ulcerative disease of the vulva caused by Haemophilus tucreae, which is a highly contagious, small, non motile gram negative rod. The soft chancre of chancroid is always painful and tender. The hard chancre of syphilis is usually asymptomatic. For when we do gram stain for a chancroid, the facultative anaerobic bacterium with a classic appearance of streptobacillary chains or the extracellular school of fish is what we usually see under the microscope. Tissue trauma and excoriation of the skin must precede initial infection because Haemophilus tucreae is unable to penetrate and invade normal intact skin. The initial lesion is a small papule and then within 48 to 72 hours, the papule evolves into a pustule and subsequently ulcerates. The extremely painful ulcers are shallow with a characteristic ragged edge as you can see here in this picture and usually occur in the ve vulvar vestibule and rarely in the vagina or cervix. The ulcers have a dirty gray necrotic foul-smelling exudate and lack the injur lack injuration at the base, or what we call the sh soft chancre. Approximately 50% of women develop acutely tender inguinal adenopathy, or a bubo, which is typically unilateral. Fluctuant nodes should be treated by needle aspiration to prevent rupture or by incision and drainage if larger than 5 cm. A definitive diagnosis of chancroid requires the identification of Haemophilus tucreae on special culture media that unfortunately are not widely available from commer commercial sources. Now, the clinical diagnosis can be made in a woman with painful vulvar ulcers after excluding other common STIs that produce vulvar ulcers such as genital herpes, syphilis, LGV, and donovanosis. The treatment for chancroid are the following as uh, recommended by CDC. We have acetromycin 1 gram orally, single dose, subtriaxone 250 mg IM, single dose, ciprofloxacin 500 mg orally twice daily for 3 days, or erythromycin base 500 mg orally 3 times daily for 7 days. Next, we have syphilis. This is a chronic complex systemic disease produced by the spirochete Treponema pallidum. Treponema pallidum is an anaerobic, elongated, tightly wound spirochete. Because of its extreme thinness, Treponema pallidum is difficult to detect by light microscopy alone. So therefore, the presence of spirochetes is diagnosed by the use of specially adapted techniques 
dark field microscopy, or direct fluorescent antibody tests such as what you see here in this picture. Patients are contagious during primary, secondary, and probably the first year of latent syphilis. Syphilis can be spread by kissing or touching a person who has an active lesion on the lips, oral cavity, breast, or genitals. Definitive diagnosis is via dark field microscopy, as I've already mentioned, to detect Trypanema pallidum in lesion exudate or tissue. Presumptive diagnosis and screening can rely on some serologic tests, and these are the nonspecific non treponemal tests, which are VDRL and RPR, RPR. So these are used as screening tests and index of treatment response. However, when we use uh, this nonspecific non treponemal test, we must uh, be wary that there could be false positive results, such as when the patient has recent febrile illness, pregnancy, immunization, chronic active hepatitis, malaria, sarcoidosis, IV drug use, HIV infection, advancing age, acute herpes simplex, and autoimmune diseases such as SLE or rheumatoid arthritis. We can also obtain a false negative result, and this commonly occurs among women in whom there is an excess of lipin antibody in the serum, and this is what we call the prozone phenomenon. Women with immunocompromised or women who are immunocompromised also may have false negative tests because of their inability to produce the antibodies detected by the screening test. Now, if a nonspecific test result is positive, meaning if your VDRL or RPR tests positive, then the significance of this result must be confirmed by using a specific antitreponemal test, and these are FTA-ABS tests, or MHATP. However, we can still have false positive results using this specific antitreponemal test, especially if the patient has SLE. A woman with a positive reactive uh, treponemal test usually will have this positive reaction for her lifetime, regardless of treatment or activity of the disease. Now, uh, this table summarizes the potential causes of biologic false positive results in syphilis serology as we have already discussed in the uh, previous slides. However, this is a better um, summary because this, is, this tells us a more complete uh, list for potential causes of false positive results. So clinically, syphilis is divided into primary, secondary, and tertiary stages. For primary syphilis, we have a papule which is usually painless and appears at the site of inoculation two to three weeks after exposure. And uh, this papule soon ulcerates to produce the classic chancre that is a painless ulcer with a raised injurated margin and a non-exudative base. The chancre is a solitary, painless, and found on the vulva, vagina, or the cervix. Non-tender and firm regional adenopathy is present during the first week of clinical disease. Now, within two to six weeks, the painless ulcer heals spontaneously, and hence, many women with uh, primary syphilis do not seek treatment. For secondary syphilis, now, if primary syphilis was left untreated, approximately 25% of women uh, develop secondary syphilis. Now, this results from hematogenous dissemination of the spirochetes. Systemic symptoms may occur such as rashes, fever, headache, malay, lymphadenopathy, and anorexia. The classic rash of secondary syphilis are the red macules and papules over the palm of the hands, as you can see here, or over the soles of the feet. Vulvar lesions of condylama latum are large, raised, flattened, grayish-white areas. Now, on wet surfaces of the vulva, soft papules often coalesce to form ulcers, and these are larger than herpetic ulcers and are not tender unless secondarily infected. Now, uh, for the latent syphilis, this follows after secondary syphilis and may vary in duration anywhere between 2 to 20 years. This is characterized as positive serology without symptoms or signs of the syphilis, and women with syphilis in the primary or secondary stages and during the first year of latent syphilis are believed to be infectious. Most women diagnosed with syphilis are detected via positive blood test during the latent stage of the disease. Early latent syphilis is an infection of one year or less. All other cases are referred to as late latent or latent syphilis of unknown duration. 
And finally, the tertiary phase of syphilis is this devastating in its potentially destructive effects on the central nervous system, cardiovascular system, and musculoskeletal systems. Manifestations of late syphilis include optic atrophy, tabis dorsalis, generalized paresis, aortic aneurysm, and gumas of the skin and the bones. A guma is similar to a cold abscess with a necrotic center, like so here in the, the picture here, and obliteration of the small vessels by end arteritis. The treatment for syphilis, so the drug of choice, is parenteral penicillin G. The CDC recommends 2.4 million units of benzathine penicillin G, IM, in one dose for early syphilis. Patients who are allergic to penicillin should receive oral tetracycline 500 mg every 6 hours for 14 days or doxycycline 100 mg orally twice a day for 2 weeks. Approximately 60% of women uh, with syphilis who may develop an acute febrile reaction associated with flu-like symptoms such as headache and myalgia within the first 24 hours after parenteral penicillin therapy for early syphilis. And this reaction is what we call the jarish herxheimer reaction. Now, this is... Um, the treatment or the recommended treatment for syphilis are uh, recommended by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention according to the stage of the syphilis. Women who have a sustained fourfold increase in non treponemal test titers have failed treatment or become reinfected, and they should be retreated and evaluated for concurrent HIV infection. When women are retreated, the recommendation is 3 weekly injections of benzathine penicillin G to 0.4 million units IM. With successful treatment, the VDRL titer will become non-reactive or at most be reactive with a lower titer within one year. All women with the first attack of primary syphilis should have a negative non-specific serology within one year, and women treated for secondary syphilis should have a negative serology within two years. If they are not, then treatment failure, reinfection, and concurrent HIV infection should be investigated. So we also have what we call the neurosyphilis, and this is a syphilis that often involves a central nervous system. The diagnosis of neurosyphilis is based on a combination of clinical findings, reactive serologic tests, and abnormalities of cerebrospinal fluid, serology, cell count, or protein. The CDC recommends aqueous crystalline penicillin G, 18 to 24 million units daily, administered as 3 to 4 million units IV every 4 hours for 10 to 14 days. An alternative regimen is procaine penicillin, 2.4 million units IM daily, plus probenicid, 500 mg orally, 4 times daily for 10 to 14 days. It is important for all women with syphilis to be tested for HIV infection and simultaneous syphilis and HIV infections actually alter the natural history of syphilis with earlier involvement of the CNS. Now, that ends my lecture for part 1 of the lower genital tract infection where we discussed uh, infections of the vulva. Part 2 of this lecture will be in a separate video. Please uh, watch this video on infections of the vagina. And part 3 will be uh, infections of the cervix. Thank you for watching this video and please stay tuned for part 2 and 3 of this uh, lecture on genital tract infections.